Good evening, everyone. Welcome to camp. Uh, my name is Adam Gebrian, and I'm going to try to guide you through this evening. Thank you very much for coming. We are really glad that we have here Danish ambassador and his wife. Of course, uh, our vice uh, mayor, Petr Hlaváček, who's going to do an introduction to the lecture. But let me tell you a bit of organizational stuff for the evening. So we're going to have, of course, a lecture of Bjarke Engels. That's why you are here. Fortunately, we can save the introduction to him because he needs no introduction. So, you know, we're going to save a bit of time. Uh, and he's going to deliver a lecture about their work and later on about specifically Prague Vltava Philharmony. At the end of the uh, evening, or let's say the lecture event, we're going to move to the smaller white hall. There is a little exhibition about the project and its current condition. Also, let me greet not only you, but uh, those of you who are watching the videos outside or at, at your home. And uh, for you who are in here, uh, I'm going to try to maximize your time to ask questions, because I think that's really important. So please already start to think about your questions. Uh, and uh, at the end of the lecture, you know, I'm going to come to you or somebody else going to come to you with the microphone. So we're going to try to have as many questions as possible. And Bjarke is willing to answer all of them. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I guess it might take longer than everyone thinks, but uh, we never know. And I think you're not going to be disappointed. It's going to take longer, no? So uh, let's start with the introduction from the Vice Mayor, Petr Hlaváček. Good evening, everybody. I'm quite happy that I am honored to open this evening. I just want to go for a few seconds to past, because I would like to uh, remind that this Philharmonic building is sort of child of the Red revolution, which is just postponed. And thanks to the team, which is group of Association for Philharmony, which is partly sitting here, and maybe later on you can ask them about this experience, how to run projects so long time. And now we are in pretty important moment on this uh, roadmap. And we have a, a study, which is one and a half year after competition. And I'm really looking forward that you will appreciate the work with the team and the architects and all people who were working on it. So everybody is looking f forward to see uh, the wonderful lecture. And I am happy also. So have a nice evening. So please, everyone, welcome Bjark Engels. It's, it's very it's very nice to be uh, to be to be back. Uh, um, a, a year and a half ago, um, last time I was I was standing here, there was a, a symphony orchestra over there, and, uh, and 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 we were entrusted with the responsibility to uh, uh, to uh, uh, develop our design for the for the for the Valtava Philharmonic, and 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 we've been spending the last um, uh, m more than a year. Uh, working towards um, our, our first like big uh, submission, which is schematic design. So we've been trying to sort of integrate it uh, in, into the uh, urban environment, make sure that uh, all the programs fit, and anything that was maybe forgotten in the competition has been has been added. So we're we're, we're in a very solid stage, uh, and and I'm going to end by by showing where we are. But 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 maybe before um, uh, I, I I begin on that. Um, I thought, sort of, uh, of, of, of course, we are we are in Prague from a, from an architectural point of view. Prague is is, is one of the most beautiful cities uh, uh, in the world, not least because of this sort of spectacular um, cohabitation of uh, of the historical architecture uh, and 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 the and the dramatic uh, topography, uh, these kind of uh, uh, natural hillsides that slope from the. Uh, from the from the river to the to the top of the spires, and and, and that's because um, Pr Prague is gifted with a with a with an incredible 
uh, uh, or like Ch uh, Ch uh, Czech Republic is gifted with an incredibly beautiful, very dramatic uh, landscape, especially uh, seen with the eyes of a, of a Dane, because uh, all, of, all of Denmark is completely flat. Uh, Copenhagen is completely flat. Uh, we have no hills uh, except Copenhill. Uh, and that, and you know, in, in, a, in a country without mountains, you have to do them yourself. It's the, it's the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. It's so clean that the steam coming out of the chimney is actually cleaner than the air of Copenhagen. Uh, so, so we've been able to uh, turn the facade into the tallest man-made uh, climbing wall in the world. It's actually our first uh, Czech collaboration. It's, uh, um, it's built by Walltopia, a Czech uh, uh, a climbing wall uh, maker. And uh, if you're too afraid to climb the facade, you can ride an elevator uh, inside the building up to the... You can admire all the technology that scrubs the CO2 and filters particles from the air. And, uh, and you can get to the roof, where you have a, 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 a man-made mountain where you can hike uh, and, and ski. Uh, and, you know, Denmark got zero medals in Sochi and in Beijing. Uh, we hope over time that's going to change uh, now that we can practice at, uh, at home. Um, uh, the, this idea of a power plant so clean that we can turn it into a, a, a mountain meadow um, is part of a, an idea that we call hedonistic sustainability. The idea that the clean technology is, is not only better for the environment, it also is much more enjoyable for the people living there. Like the sustainable city, the sustainable building is not just better for the environment, it's more enjoyable for the people that, that live in it. Uh, and we discovered this idea uh, more than two decades ago when we completed our first project. It's, um, I think it's my own echo uh, outside. Uh, that's interesting. I think it's scientifically proven that when there is an echo, you start stuttering. So uh, keep an eye out. Uh, but we, we designed the, the Copenhagen Harbor Bath, essentially extending the life of the city uh, into the water around it. Uh, and we also designed the Harbor Bath in Aarhus, uh, sort of doing the, 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 the same thing. And, and when we opened it, uh, we thought it was kind of clear that, uh, that there was something special happening here. That, a clean port is not only nice for the fish, it's also amazing for the citizens that live in that city. They don't have to drive their cars for hours to get to the beach. They can literally jump in the port in the middle of the city. Um, so that became the sort of advent of hedonistic uh, sustainability. Um, and um, shortly after, like, or like a decade after, uh, we uh, opened the Danish pavilion in Shanghai. Uh, the subject for the World Expo was um, Better Cities, Better Life. And, and we thought of the pavilion as a, as a conden condensation of all the things that make Danish cities more sustainable and also more enjoyable. So you have the blue bicycle lanes of, uh, of Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen was also the first city in the world to have a system of free city bikes that people could just simply borrow. More than 50% of the Copenhageners commute uh, by bicycle. Uh, so in the pavilion, the, we could remind the Chinese the thrill of, uh, of riding a bike through the city instead of being stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, it also made it the perfect museum for impatient people, because you could drive through the whole exhibition in, in five minutes without missing uh, anything. Um, and um, in, in, the, in the heart of the pavilion, uh, we recreated the harbor bath, uh, uh, allowing the, the Chinese to feel how clean, uh, if not how cold, Danish harbor water is. Um, and um, we were trying to find a way to attract the Chinese, and we were looking for common denominators between Denmark and China. And, and we found that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, one of them being the story of the Little Mermaid the national symbol of Denmark. So we proposed to move the mermaid to China. Uh, I had to go to parliament to argue uh, her case. Uh, and as you can see, we, uh, we got her. Uh, then we had to get her through Chinese customs. Uh, and, and, and finally, she made it uh, to, um, to the pavilion. And, and then we thought sort of um, to, um, 
to heal the wound that she left behind for the six months she was gone, uh, we, um, we invited uh, Ai Weiwei uh, to, to, to imagine uh, an art installation in her absence. Uh, and he created, uh, he, he mounted a, a surveillance camera, a Chinese surveillance camera in the pavilion that was shooting a live footage to a video screen <laughs> mounted uh, uh, in her absence in Copenhagen. So when the tourists would go in vain, they could see that she was okay. She was just on the other side of the planet. Um, and he called it the Mermaid Exchange, uh, that it was the only uncensored live TV feed from China to the rest of the world for six months. Um, so, so that was like a series of, of pursuits of this idea of, of hedonistic sustainability. Um, also, also because, like Prague in Copenhagen, the water is really uh, a very significant part of the of the urban experience. Uh, and uh, and for instance, like uh, in in front, you see a, a little village uh, we created uh, using um, upcycled uh, decommissioned containers. Uh, we actually um, put them on a barge in a shipyard in Poland. Uh, then, when the weather was nice, uh, we we dragged it across the Baltic Sea. Uh, and into the port of, of Copenhagen. Uh, and in, in one of these uh, urban rigors, we, we call them, uh, you have 18 students uh, uh, living. Uh, and essentially, like, very compact living. Uh, we used a, a NASA insulation, so we have very thin, thin walls, so we could recycle the, the container as it was. Uh, and you have a beautiful view to the clean port of Copenhagen. Uh, you can jump uh, out of your window and into the water, and you can get back uh, inside. Um, so essentially, you, these students may never get a better lifestyle than they have right now. Uh, uh, you know, photovoltaics, heat pumps uh, in the ground, uh, a green roof and a little terrace. Um, and um, just to, uh, I don't know, practice what I preach, uh, I, I myself actually live, uh, oops, uh, I live, uh, let me just try, I, I live here. Uh, in, a, in a decommissioned uh, car ferry from Norway. Um, and essentially where the cars used to park, uh, we put a, a glass facade. Uh, we, we cut some holes to get light uh, uh, be beneath the deck. Um, and, and essentially you have this kind of pretty futuristic... A lot of people think I'm... I'm, I'm actually, it's, uh, it's my son's office uh, here and it's my office over there. You can see who's the architect, uh, but, but um, my desk always looks like that. Um, so a, a lot of people think I'm dialing in from a spaceship when, uh, uh, when I'm having Zoom calls. Uh, but, but essentially trying to reimagine uh, all the aspects of this old uh, ferry uh, and, and try to find a, a nice way of, of living. I, I like the place, especially because I see the sun rising over a mountain uh, uh, we build ourselves. And, uh, and, and setting over the Queen's Palace. Um, but um, one, one sort of way to explain the, let's call it the power of architecture, is to explain the Danish word for design, which is uh, form giving, uh, which literally means form giving. Uh, because to design something is to give form to that which has not yet been given form. In other words, to give form to the future. Because when we're designing a space or a building, we are giving form to the world that we would like to find ourselves living in, in the future. And when you think about it like that, design is, becomes much more important than style or aesthetics uh, and fashion. And it really becomes about what kind of world would we like to live in. Uh, and um, maybe just a, a, a few examples to sort of elaborate on this idea. Th this is one of my favorite photos. Um, it's all the richest people in Denmark and me. Uh, it's, it's basically the family that makes Lego. Um, it says something about a country when, when the richest people are the people that make Lego. But, but, uh, but they asked us to imagine the home of the Lego brick. Uh, an architecture where you could unfold the potential of, of Lego. So, of course, this is the architectural model. 
for those of you who are architects, a Lego man is a, is a 1 to 50 uh, person, proportioned roughly like myself. Uh, and, um, and this is the real building. Um, and, and we try to sort of imagine an architecture that would be as inviting and engaging and as inclusive as Lego is itself. So the roof is a series of interconnected playgrounds uh, uh, that sort of invite people to climb the, the building and, and explore with, without a ticket. It's, it's, it's this kind of porous collision of, of volumes that is open in all corners, so you can enter the Lego square. Light comes in between the galleries uh, above. The citizens of Bilon can roam around freely without a, a ticket. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, you can ascend into the galleries themselves. Uh, and it may be one of the only museums in the world where you are encouraged to touch all the artifacts. And, and I think um, what I like about Lego and why I think it's important is Lego is a tool, not a toy. It's a tool that empowers the child to create his or her own world and then to inhabit that world through play and to invite her friends in joining her in co-creating and cohabiting that world. And, 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 and that at its best is exactly what architecture uh, sh should be. As, as, as human beings, we have the power to imagine our world, to create it and co-create it and to cohabit it. Um, a few other examples. Um, this is uh, uh, Tirana, the, the, the capital of Albania. Uh, and, and, and here we were invited to imagine uh, their national theater. And, um, you know, Al Albania is, has a kind of m modest economy and a sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's actually having an architectural renaissance these days, but, but still a relatively simple, low-tech kind of construction industry. So we thought, in a way, to, to make the simplest possible building. Imagine all of the front of house overlooking a park, all of the back of house uh, looking at a, at a city, and then basically connecting the front of house and back of house with uh, the, the, the main venue and, and a few sort of uh, uh, black box uh, uh, stages. Um, and, and that essentially, the front and back of house becomes like uh, almost like a vitrine where during the day when they're doing rehearsals, you can look in and see what's happening. So even during the daytime, it's, it's a very sort of a, uh, open and transparent building. And then in the middle, uh, it's pinched to perform a gateway between the plaza on one side uh, and, and the, pretty much the city hall on the other side. Uh, and that, that kind of wrinkled opening creates a covered plaza that is the entrance into the, into the theater. Um, so like a, a kind of very simple uh, sort of public gesture that becomes an, an invitation. You can always pass through and under the, the, the theater, uh, shading from the Mediterranean sun, uh, made out of uh, this kind of red uh, uh, um, upcycled uh, uh, concrete. Uh, and then underneath, on one side, you have the main entrance. On the other side, you actually see the understage. So uh, if you walk by when there's actually a play happening above, you might see, uh, you know, Harry Potter waiting to appear uh, on on the uh, on on the stage, um, uh, and as you move in, again we try to keep everything as simple as possible. Uh, I mean, the the the, the national color of uh, of Albania is red. We found this beautiful red stone that is uh, locally uh, uh, sourced, and 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 then you basically find this kind of journey moving up. Uh, along the, the the main the main hall, um, and as you continue up uh, towards the the, the roof, um, the, the the main hall is 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 faceted out of uh, um, hot rolled steel. So so we try to to use like very simple uh, uh, material, a mixture of perforation and reflective surfaces it creates the perfectly calibrated acoustics, almost like an origami of uh, of black steel. Um, the multifunction halls all have views and visibility and, and possibility of, uh, of daylight. Um, and, and on the roof, uh, the kind of cringe where the, the, the big boxy volume is, is, is minimized on the, on the middle, you have 
the, 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 the second auditorium, can actually open its backstage out to the roof, and the whole roof becomes a gigantic uh, starlit uh, open air uh, uh, performance space. So, so in some way, we've tried to sort of squeeze at as much creative energy and performance possibility into the smallest uh, possible volume. And, and it, it's, it's currently under construction, but I, but I think in many ways it's, it's going to be a building that looks different because it performs differently. It's, it's all the possibilities it creates that sort of has created its, uh, its architecture. Um, and also, you don't have to do a national theater or a philharmonic to, to, uh, to send a message. Um, this is probably our smallest project. It's a single room hotel uh, on the Arctic Circle in Lapland in, in Finland, well, in, in Sweden. And um, um, we, um, we got invited to, to create this one room hotel, like a tree house, uh, and, and to sort of maximize the immersion into nature. We spoke with an ornithologist that, that could tell us exactly which birds uh, nest in this area, <clears throat> and bats and bees. Uh, so we, we basically created a, a village of 350 birdhouses. Uh, I, I think there's 12 different designs, all tailored to different kinds of uh, uh, animals. Uh, actually, a bat house is very similar to a birdhouse, but the hole is in the bottom. Uh, and then you can basically, uh, you wake up to bird tweets, you shower together with a squirrel, and, and you find yourself like fully immersed into, uh, uh, into nature. You have... Uh, you know, windows looking down, looking around, and, and looking up. Uh, so it, it, it really becomes the smallest possible statement. Uh, you know, we take advantage of the natural slope, so an ADA accessible ramp comes from above and enters into, the, uh, into this kind of sphere of, uh, of birds. And just to anticipate the question, um, it's important to know that birds don't drop where they nest. Uh, and, and the window cleaner can confirm. So, uh, um, but, but essentially, this idea that with a very small uh, uh, building, you can actually send uh, a strong message in this case about immersion into nature. Um, an another sort of example of, of an architecture that uh, cohabits with a river. Um, of, of course, for the Valtava Philharmonic, the river is, a, is the namesake and therefore a very important character in the in the urban site and the, and the architecture. This is a, an art museum we designed uh, in, uh, in Norway in a sculpture park. And the sculpture park is on two sides of a river. And we suggested that the museum could be the bridge that takes you from one side of the river to the other. A horizontal gallery with views and a vertical gallery without uh, daylight. Uh, as the building crosses the river, it turns 90 degrees and also zips closed the, the daylight. Um, and even though it's a very sculptural form, when you look closer, you can see it's actually made out of standard extruded aluminum profiles, the same that you use to make uh, warehouses. Uh, and inside, um, so a lot of identical elements that are put together in a carefully orchestrated way. Uh, inside, it's basically uh, white painted two by four timber. Um, essentially what, what all of Norway is, uh, is made of. Uh, and, and simply just, again, by gently shifting the orientation, you can see every single piece of timber is, is standard. But by leaving half of them open, we have the, all the necessary ventilation for state-of-the-art uh, museum climate control, all the lighting. Um, so you can say it's, it's almost creating something extraordinary out of a lot of ordinary. And you can really see it as a, as a museum that is also a bridge and that is also a sculpture uh, in a sculpture park. And, and, and again, sort of um, finding ways to deal with, uh, with the proximity to, the, to, a, to a river, we, we, uh, we designed and built um, Mecca, La Maison de la Économie Créative d'Aquitaine, it's a kind of regional art foundation and a library and a um, uh, performance center in, uh, uh, on the waterfront of Garonne in, in Bordeaux. 
Um, it's, it's actually right next to the first bridge designed and built by uh, Gustav Eiffel. Um, and, and, the, and the basic idea was very simple. Take the three institutions and, and turn them into a single, uh, uh, single building, like a frame between the city and the, and the river. Uh, it becomes an extension of the promenade. So as you walk along the Garonne River, the, the museum lifts you up, allows you to pass through and continue on your journey uh, along the, the river. Um, essentially, the theater and the library becomes the pillars that carries the art museum. The art museum occupies the top, where it has uh, skylights and, uh, and a sculpture park. And then, the, um, of course, the, 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 the foyer for all three institutions uh, on the ground. And then it creates this uh, urban room that is shaded from the uh, 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 Bordeaux sun. It's, the, it's one of the hottest cities in, uh, in France. Um, gently lifts the public up through the building uh, and out. It creates like these kind of e uh, effortless seating in the shade of the building overlooking the, uh, the river. And simply just by opening the, the, the facade a tiny bit, we create openings. Uh, so all the programs that lead daylight are sort of visible from the outside, almost like a, a little pattern. Um, it had a very modest budget. It's a regional art foundation uh, with, with public money. Uh, so uh, all, all the finishes, we try to be almost like Le Corbusian in, uh, 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 in, in just every finish is like a, a very sort of raw and, and simple material. Uh, we, we worked with um, Benoit Mayer. Uh, he created a, a, a Hermes head uh, and it's located <clears throat> exactly where the the void is cut out of the building, so the absence of the art piece is actually the most interesting uh, uh, part of it. Um, and then, of course, as, as you enter in, a little storytelling pit also cast out of the, the raw material of the building, uh, the, the, the structure, the, all, all the surfaces. It's, it's really like a, a, a warehouse for the arts. Uh, you have a little periscope that uh, allows views from the big space at the top down into the uh, into the foyer, and uh, as you ascend up uh, the, the theater uh, with the skylit stage, so for rehearsals they have daylight, and finally the the art space on the uh, on the roof and the beautiful view of the of the city. <clears throat> so like um, so so really sort of almost like an extension of the of the industrial neighborhood behind, bringing the city and its life all the way down to the to the waterfront, and um. Maybe like a bit more than a decade ago, um, I got invited to um, to make a proposal for a building on the waterfront of, of Manhattan, uh, and we took that as an opportunity to, uh, in, for, in my own case, to move to New York uh, and open our studio there. <clears throat> and um, and since it was going to be our first uh, building in America and on one of the most spectacular skylines in the world, we thought we should do something really simple. You know, do something we know how to do. Don't fuck it up. Uh, and um, we thought we should make a, a courtyard building. All uh, all buildings in Copenhagen are courtyards. And um, and essentially, the courtyard is a little oasis in the middle of the city. It's communal, uh, so it's shared by everybody. All 700 apartments, uh, which is why you can actually leave your tricycle and your toys at night, and they'll be there the next morning. So we tried, how do you combine that with the density and verticality of a skyscraper? And, and the answer became the, the court scraper. So it's essentially the height of a skyscraper to the, to the northeast, and it's the height of a handrail uh, in the southwest. So everybody who lives around the courtyard actually has views of the, of the sun setting over the, the, the Hudson River. So it's almost like bringing the communal qualities of a, of a Copenhagen courtyard with a sort of verticality and density of, a, of an American skyscraper. And, and, then, and then maybe sort of a, a last port, port building. Um, in Amsterdam, we recently opened the Slice House. It's essentially a, a Barcelona block. It's 100 by 100 meters, 10 floors tall. Uh, and then very simply, um, 
it's, it's next to a, a marina. We put a, a floating solar farm in the water and, and covered the whole roof. There's a public promenade uh, where people can overlook the, the city of Amsterdam that's also completely framed by photovoltaics. Um, and then basically towards the, the northeast, we lift up the courtyard so you can sail into, uh, into the city block. Uh, the local kids can, uh, can swim, you can dock uh, a boat, and it becomes like a comp complete sort of fusion between the public realm, the port, and the, and the private. The facade is made out of uh, maritime uh, aluminum, <clears throat> the same you make boats of, so the, the facade literally continues into the, into the water. And to the southwest, to let in sunlight, uh, some of the apartments become houses with gardens, and you can actually walk uh, all the way up to the public promenade. So the, the building itself becomes an extension of the city landscape of, uh, of Amsterdam. It's also pi piled on energy piles, extracting heat and cold from the, from the port uh, and using it to heat and cool the, the, the building. <clears throat> Um, and, and, and lastly, um, we, we ourselves actually just finished our, our own headquarters in, uh, in Copenhagen. <clears throat> you can see it's still half a construction site. It's at the end of the city, uh, so the, the street ends here, and here we have just planted 56 trees. So this summer we're going to open a public park. Um, and, and we tried to sort of imagine a seven-story building uh, where everybody is working in the same space. Uh, so every floor is only half built, and every floor is connected to a terrace that is connected to the terrace above and the terrace below. So you can actually walk all the way from the roof garden and all the way down to the park uh, outside the building. And, uh, and inside, it also works as a fire stair, like a Soho fire stair that's outside the building. Inside you always have views and access to your colleagues above and below. There's no core in the middle. There's only a, a single column, uh, a little piece of stone between the, the beams of the floors. So that it, in some way, we've managed to transform a seven-story building into one team working in, in one space. Um, and, and then, of course, you have these kind of spectacularly framed views of the, uh, of the surrounding city. So, so this is what our workspace uh, looks like, um, trying to, to translate a lot of our practice into, uh, uh, in, into reality. Uh, but of course, in, uh, in March 2020, suddenly our workspace looked like this. Uh, like everybody else, we went remote, except our model workshop. Um, we, we found out that the 3D printers and the plexi sheets we use for making models could actually be used to make emergency medical equipment like face shields and ventilator tubes. And in uh, the first six weeks, uh, we managed to manufacture 25,000 of these items and give them to the local healthcare providers until the um, supply chain could catch up. Um, and we thought that was like quite interesting that almost by accident, uh, we had within our company the tools and the skills to address one of the most urgent issues on Earth at the time, access to emergency medical equipment. So we, we thought, like, what, what else, what would be the biggest problem we could address uh, with the skills we have as architects and, and planners? Uh, the planet. So, so we thought... Uh, what if we would actually use our methodology as architects and planners to make a plan for a sustainable human presence on the planet? Um, and, and we started doing it. We, thought, we started with a number. 173,000 terawatt hours per year, that's the total energy bill of all of Earth. Um, and um, if you look back, um, 200 years, we've always been burning wood. Uh, then we discovered coal, uh, oil, and gas. Uh, and even the renewables today is a relatively small uh, part on the top. But you can see this sort of 
explosion in access to energy led to one of the greatest increases in quality of life. So you can see like measured in life expectancy on every single continent, it created an incredible transformation for, for everybody. Um, but of course the side effect is that each year we emit 50 billion tons of CO2, the equivalent of two by two by two kilometers of coal. Uh, and, and every year we add another one. And, and, and the, the carbon emissions get, get trapped in the atmosphere and they trap heat and, and cook the planet. You know the story. So we thought greenhouse gas emissions come from CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and F gases. Uh, and they come from a whole range of human activities. And to sort of create a framework for the plan for the planet, um, we divided it into five verticals related to greenhouse gas emissions. They're transportation, energy, industry, food, and waste. Uh, but then another five unrelated to climate change, but still essential to solve if you want to have a sustainable human presence on Earth, biodiversity, health, pollution with like particles in the air or plastics in the oceans, habitation and, and access to water. So for simplicity, I'll only sort of talk about greenhouse gas emissions, but, but essentially we also asked, what's the problem we have to solve? We're 8 billion people today, 7.7 .7 when we started. Uh, we will be 10, so it's a bigger problem. And we should all have access to the same quality of life as, say, Denmark. So the problem is actually twice as big. But this is the problem we should solve. And, um, and then to make it tangible, we thought, why don't we scale it down to one earthling? That was one earthling. This is uh, 100 earthlings. Uh, you can fit a million earthlings on a square kilometer. And if all of Earth would go to a giant Woodstock music festival, they could fit on 100 by 100 kilometers. Um, so instead we thought like, since it's about like a sustainable presence on Earth, if we divide all of Earth into 10 billion equally sized plots of land, then like each of you would have a share in 225 by 225 uh, meters. Uh, two thirds would be ocean. Uh, a tenth would be uninhabitable, glaciers, mountains. <clears throat> and then roughly one hectare would be habitable. And half would be agriculture and city, and the other half would be nature. Um, and essentially, this is where all our problems come from. All the emissions, all the, the transformations. And, and if we start with energy as almost three quarters of the issue, uh, we use energy to power um, our buildings, uh, our transportation, and our industry. And with using only existing technology, you can electrify all of these industries uh, today, which means that you can power them with, uh, instead of using Every year, each of us use this much oil, coal, and glass, gla gas. You can deliver the same amount of energy with this much offshore wind and sun. And if you have the same sort of energy use as Denmark, you need a little bit more. And then, of course, you have to store it. And you can store half as batteries and half as hydrogen. Um, and hydrogen, when it comes from electrolysis using renewable energy, is essentially a completely CO2 neutral source of, of power, fuel, fertilizer, materials, uh, uh, fuel cells. Um, today we already started converting our cars. One billion cars are bec becoming more and more uh, uh, electric. Uh, but if you would try to power uh, a Boeing 747 with batteries, the battery pack would weigh 15,000 tons, making it difficult to fly. So you have a lot of industries that require uh, a more energy-dense source from, uh, from, from hydrogen. Uh, if you look at industry, some of the uh, emissions come from, from energy, but some of them come from the chemical processes. Like, for instance, when you uh, burn uh, lime to create uh, cement, you emit CO2 chemically. So each time you convert one ton of concrete or steel to timber, you reduce the carbon footprint of the building with 2.2 tons. Um, 
then of course that it, there's everything we throw away. Uh, you know, s the materials we can uh, recycle and upcycle, but all the organic waste, we can actually turn it into biomethane. Biomethane is essentially natural gas, but it turns waste into a renewable resource uh, uh, when, you, when you gasify uh, the organic waste. And, and then there's like the largest footprint, all the agriculture, we get methane uh, from cow burps and, and rice fields. Um, when we uh, burn cr crop residue, it emits uh, CO2 and, and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. Um, when, we, uh, when we fertilize, similarly, nitrous oxide gets into the atmosphere. And every year we expand our agricultural footprint with roughly one square meter per person emitting CO2 from roots and, and soil and, and deforestation. Um, so if you start looking at wh what are we doing with these crops, <clears throat> these crops are energy crops, so it's basically palm oil and, and corn that we grow in only to burn it. We can produce the same amount of energy with this much solar, so much more uh, efficient. Um, in, instead of burning crop residue, we can uh, turn it into natural gas by, by gasifying it. Um, and instead of leaving the land fallow, uh, we can actually have cattle grazing the, the fields when we don't grow crops, uh, increasing yields and, and reducing footprint. Um, and that, that, that leads us to the sort of um, the elephant in the room or the cow. Uh, a cow and a calf requires two hectares of grassland, uh, but they burp uh, 100 kilos of methane per year, or the equivalent to 108 tons of CO2. Um, and to sequester one ton of CO2 in a year, you need one fully grown tree. So it just so happens that 108 trees fit perfectly on two hectares of land. Uh, and actually, the, the natural habitat for large ruminants is a silvopasture, the combination of animal husbandry and, and trees. So by converting to silvopasture consistently, you get happier cows, uh, you, get, uh, you increase biodiversity, and you sort of make a much more beautiful natural landscape, and uh, you, the, the trees will sequester the greenhouse gas emissions from the, from the cows. And, and for instance, like, if you look at the last 50 years, uh, the amount of land used for cereals remains uh, the same, but the yields have more than doubled. So if we simply convert to existing proven technologies and existing proven methods, such as silvopasture and polyculture, uh, we can actually take the necessary footprint necessary to sustain one earthling sustainably from this to this. And if you add the footprint of the windmills and the solar farms, uh, and you can even combine wind and sun with agriculture, you can actually see that it fits perfectly uh, and comfortably within the available uh, uh, square we have, and this is what we actually use today. So it's, it's quite clear that we don't have to wait for new technologies to be invented before we, we can act and solve the problem using only existing proven technologies. Uh, and, and we don't need like 10 Earths to sustain a population of 10 billion people with the quality of life of Denmark. We actually can perfectly fit within, within what we have. So, so it's not really a technological or design problem, it's actually an execution problem. Uh, and of course it needs, and, and you can see this is how much it requires to sustain all of the Danes, and this is Denmark, and how much it requires to sustain the, the Americans, uh, uh, or, or even all of, all of Earth. So, um, and, and of course this process has to happen uh, you know, incrementally. We need to sort of electrify uh, all of our homes so we can power them uh, electrically with, uh, with renewable energy. We need to upgrade the envelopes to reduce heat loss and uh, uh, and, and overheating, we need to build with sustainable materials, we need to harvest the available uh, energy. Uh, we need to move between our buildings with uh, electric mobility or bikes and uh, uh, or walking. It's actually easy to make cities more walkable and bikeable by making them greener. Uh, then we need to convert uh, our, our, our waste, we need to harvest renewable uh, energy so we can power uh, our, our industry and our buildings and, uh, and our transportation. 
we need to convert to uh, the most efficient uh, form of agriculture so we can create more forests, so we can increase biodiversity around our cities, but also so the trees can sequester the carbon we still emit. And essentially, as you, as you move through the, all across the, the territory at every scale, we need to implement things that we already uh, uh, know, know what are. Um, so, so you can say, like, of, of course, at, at big, and, and this is only a, a fragment of, of, of the plan for the planet that we've done as, a, as an in-house research project, essentially just to answer some of our own questions. And of course, we don't have any jurisdiction over Earth, so no one asked us to do this. So what's the point? I, I think what I see happening already to ourselves and our collaborators is that doing the plan for the planet has given us an insight and a clarity that we didn't have before. And we started aligning the projects we do with the principles uh, of, of the plan for the planet as, as, as good as we can. And, and, and that means that like, sort of almost like project by project, we're beginning to give form to a future that, that is more aligned with, uh, with the principles of the plan for the, for the planet. And just a few examples. This is the, the most environmentally friendly factory in the world, in, uh, in Norway. It's made out of locally sourced timber. We negotiated with the fire department that we only had to cut five meters of trees around it. So the evergreen forest acts as sun shading, so the factory workers look out into this kind of beautiful, it's like working, making furniture inside a forest. Uh, it's entirely made out of, uh, out of timber, um, which, which almost makes it like a, a museum grade factory. Uh, they do paint and woodwork, so the two materials you have is paint and, and woodwork. It was kind of funny because we got this idea that all the floors are color coded by what processes they uh, occupy. And then of course we needed to source the machines in the same colors. So, so we had this kind of it's f f funny process of, of, of calling uh, you know, a guy in, in Munich in, in Germany and, and telling him that we want his machine in pink. And he's like, uh, nicht möglich. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and then uh, uh, in, in the middle, all the administration overlooks the, uh, the, the, the factory. Uh, and uh, the roof is covered in, uh, in photovoltaics and um, naturally sourced, locally sourced uh, turf. So we even sort of took wood stubs, et cetera, so the, the habitat on the roof um, has the same um, habitat richness. So after we built the building, there's the same amount of habitat for the local animals as, as there was before. Um, so... Uh, in, in Luxembourg, we are completing uh, a 90,000 square meter uh, timber building in the, in, in the airport. Um, and it's, it's, it's mostly timber, except on the ground floor. It's, it's concrete for anti-terror purposes, which means that the raw building already looks beautiful. Like, before you put any finishes, uh, you have this kind of uh, incredible environment. And because you have some pretty large spans, we couldn't make the, the big girders entirely out of timber. Uh, so, so we took this kind of process where most of the members could actually be timber, but then some of them would become stupidly big in timber, so we just changed them to, to steel. So it's like 90% um, timber, 10% steel. Uh, and you end up having a, almost like pedagogical understanding of how the, the, the structure works. And sort of encouraged by this, uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's currently on a construction finishing in, uh, 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 at, the, uh, at, the, at the beginning of next year. Um, we, uh, we're designing the, the main airport uh, terminal of Zurich, uh, which will be the largest timber building on Earth, entirely made from locally sourced Swiss pine and, and fir. Um, so you'll be able to smell it when you get off the, 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 the plane. Uh, you have a skylight that opens up as the maximum building envelope increases. Um, and in the middle you have the, the control tower, almost like a, a campanile in the middle of a square, uh, pulling up the skylight. So the skylight becomes the, the control tower. Like as an architect, you're always afraid when you announce a design, what is going to be the nickname. 
uh, and and in, in this case, it became the espresso uh, uh, cooker, you know, uh, which, which I think is a good name, you know. Um, and in, in Sevilla, uh, the hottest city in, uh, in Spain, uh, we are building the joint research center for the European Commission. It's half a public square and half uh, uh, the, the, the European Commission. Uh, it's covered by this kind of canopy of photovoltaic panels that, that creates a shaded square, which means that we can make the facade in one of the sunniest places in, a, in, a, in the world entirely out of glass because it's already shaded before the, the sun hits it. So you just have soft daylight, it's a naturally ventilated square, um, making it very comfortable and, and meaning that the, the citizens of Sevilla can see what the, the commissioners are, uh, are doing. Um, uh, also, you have a series of, uh, of lovely outdoor spaces for the, for the people working there. Um, and it means that the building actually produces twice as much energy as it, as it consumes. So in the end, the, the photovoltaics are funded and, and maintained by the local energy company. Uh, so it becomes almost like an energy machine or a decentralized power plant uh, in its own right. And, and I had the privilege to present uh, this project and, and a few others and the plan for the planet at the Vatican, um, along with a, a summit with the president of the EU, Ursula von der Leyen. And if you ever have to visit the Pope, and you think about what to give him, he already has a framed photo of the, of the, of the Joint Research Center in Sevilla. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not a Catholic, but if I was, this could be my ticket to, uh, to go to heaven. Um, and, 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 and maybe lastly, uh, uh, for, for Google, we created this kind of canopy of photovoltaics in a beautiful landscape next to the, the San Francisco Bay. Uh, and the landscape is actually root zone gardens. So the roof canopy collects all uh, rainwater. Then all the gray and black wastewater is actually filtered through the landscape and then let clean into the, into the bay. So the landscape that you see as beauty is actually also performing. The, the only material is photovoltaic tiles. The Googlers call them dragon scales. But it's essentially a, a, a Swiss, Swiss product that has a kind of textured surface, so it doesn't look so reflective. It's, it's quite beautiful uh, material. So the only facade material uh, uh, is, is basically making power out of light. And then the structure is uh, a grid shell that has a catenary curve, because the, the, the natural sagging is the most materially efficient way to make a long span, so minimizing you can see how incredibly thin the, 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 the roof structure is. Um, and then the smiles are proportioned to let in just the perfect amount of daylight to make sure that everybody has, uh, has light. So, so I think that all, all of these projects are essentially examples of how uh, I, I think the, the, the future can, can, can not only be more sustainable, but also more fun to, to work in and, and more beautiful to uh, uh, to, to, to live in. And, um, and, and then, of course, what I've been spending the last year and a half on, uh, like, like I mentioned last time I was here, it was uh, a, an incredible day of celebration. Uh, it was the first time I tasted the pork sandwiches that we just had again. Uh, it, it brought back sweet memories. Uh, and, uh, and, and the last sort of year and a half, uh, we've been working hard towards, in February, we will, we will be submitting uh, uh, schematic design, which is essentially uh, uh, all, all the sort of uh, traffic solutions, all the sort of urban integration, and and and, and all the programming, and, um, and 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 I would sort of love to sort of um, sh sh show you uh, where we have, have have arrived, because obviously we've 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 been been through quite a journey, and it would be disappointing if you can't recognize what we showed uh, a year and a half ago. But, but essentially, the idea uh, of the Valtava Philharmonic is to almost like celebrate uh, the journey of the Valtava River, like portrayed in the Valtava uh, Symphony, the, the journey from the, 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 the stream, the, the source in the mountains, the stream that goes through the sort of uh, bohemian forest, passes through dams, through cities, uh, and eventually makes it to, uh, uh, to, to the big city. Um, 
and sort of in return also to to sort of celebrate the urban spectacle of a, of a city full of like well-defined beautiful plazas, the kind of dramatic streets that reach belvederes and rooftops uh, and, and a sort of river that in itself is a destination with riverbanks and, and bridges and, uh, and, 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 and the public buildings presenting themselves on the, on the waterfront. And, and, and this kind of whole almost tradition there is in the organization of Prague that you have these public buildings with, with generous public squares uh, uh, presenting themselves to the river, that the, the facades uh, uh, of, of some of the main cultural buildings become like have an address on the Valtava, Valtava River. And, and in that sense, we try to capture all those elements and Im imagine an architecture that essentially is in itself a journey from the river to the roof, uh, and that is as public and engaging and inviting, uh, uh, you know, on the outside, uh, over it, under it, and, uh, and, and inside of it. And, and this is how the, 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 the project looks to, uh, today. So, so essentially, to, um, to bring the, the city center and the life of the city center down to the, to the, to the river, create a, a, a landmark both for the, for the neighborhood but for the, for the city, to resolve this kind of Gordian knot of trams and trains and highways and uh, and metro uh, stops and pedestrians and and cars in a in a in a in a kind of three-dimensional city uh, to create um, a literal and accessible uh, connection to the to to the river uh, to provide a sort of um, an active social environment for the for the for the fine performing arts but also for the for the popular culture uh, and then of course to create this kind of perfectly tuned instrument for the performance and delivery of symphonic music. Uh, so um, our basic idea was to try to organize the, the program as efficiently and as rationally as possible. So with the, with the main hall and the smaller halls, uh, with the foyers uh, adjoining it, the rehearsal spaces for the orchestras, rehearsal spaces for the musical school, and a kind of rooftop destination. And similarly in plan, this kind of perfect uh, rectangular organization of a foyer that faces the plaza, the city, and the river, the small hall, the multipurpose hall, the main hall, the orchestra rehearsal. And then from this incredibly rational uh, uh, sort of orthogonal uh, diagram, use the public realm, the canopies, uh, the, 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 the porticos and the terraces to create uh, a public destination, and similarly in plan, to blur the distinction between inside and outside by pulling out the canopies to connect with the environment, to create a zone that is neither indoor nor outdoor, that is protected from the rain and shaded from the sun. Um, and, 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 and this kind of very basic principle cr created this... Uh, this, this building that, that, that literally starts at the, at the edge of the water and, and winds itself up to the, to, to the main level of the city and the bridge. And from here, creates a series of, of destinations and lookouts all the way to, to, the, to the top of the city. That also means that a, a, a music student can actually walk all the way up to class on the outside of the, of the building. Um, so you can see the, um, the, 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 the site plan very simply occupying the space between the, the bridge for the train and, and the bridge for the cars. Um, a, a big plaza um, in front of the, uh, of, of the building to the, to the west, a uh, direct ascent off the bridge and down into, uh, uh, in, into below ground and onto the highway that has now been sort of overflown so instead of having cars dominating the waterfront, suddenly it becomes public life. Uh, and then essentially, this is the level of the city, but you don't really know where the building ends or the city begins. And you have these incredibly generous spaces uh, where public life is invited to, to, to enter and, uh, and linger. So here you see the, the, the building facing the, the river. Of course, the reflection into the river becomes a major part of the the kind of visual architecture. From the city side, you can see into sort of a, 
uh, green rooms, rehearsal rooms, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the kind of culture hub with the uh, musical studios. And of course, at night, the sort of transparency sort of illuminates the, the, the wooden undersides made out of locally sourced uh, timber. Um, towards the, the water. Again, this kind of, by pulling out the balconies and, and, the, and the terraces, you get these kind of lookouts where you are almost at the edge of the, uh, of the water's edge. Um, a, a, a kind of stone, stone pavement also made out of locally sourced uh, uh, stone. Uh, and the sort of integration of, uh, of, of greenery sort of blurs the distinction between what, what, is, uh, what is park, what is plaza, what is, uh, what is building. <clears throat> and then the kind of s s stepping uh, uh, of stones create a series of like informal hangout spaces or even sort of informal uh, performance spaces. So it becomes, you know, what, what could normally or sometimes be construed as a kind of fine art, highbrow uh, cultural institution becomes a very sort of welcoming and accessible landscape of of kind of familiar local local materials and and an abundance of places with with views and and shade and uh, uh, and, and sun and, and shelter. So on on the plaza level, uh, between the, the the city and the traffic of the of the main street, uh, a kind of a very permeable zone that also becomes an informal hangout space. So before performances or, 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 or after a, a, a place to linger and, uh, and hang out. Uh, and here's sort of the, the kind of urban corner uh, from the northwest, uh, um, the kind of main, main urban facade, uh, and a kind of view into the, uh, the public foyer. And again, sort of when the, when the, when the, when the light drops, and the sort of energy rises, the, the building sort of really comes alive when it starts actually inviting uh, uh, um, guests for, uh, for the performances. And here sort of m moving closer, the kind of, the, the drama, even, even though all, all the sort of um, sloping roofs are quite gentle in their ascent, at, at certain angles it really becomes this kind of inc incredibly dramatic uh, overlapping of uh, uh, of forms. So, so um, as, as part of the project, we've we sort of we put a lot of energy in making it. To, today, the site is this kind of open, gaping wound of of infrastructure, and and in the future, it will be sort of incredibly accessible. Uh, arriving across the bridge, you essentially have the choice to connect directly to the plaza from across the street. Again, passing through the the, the trees of the plaza that provide shade, you end up having. Uh, a major arrival plaza uh, in, in front of the, the foyer. The foyer wraps the, the, the city and the, uh, and the riverfront. Uh, and um, between the, the, the viaduct, you have a sort of more like intimately proportioned alley, but still with open connections on both sides. Um, and of course, access from, from buses, from the, from the metro, from, uh, from across the street. So, so really sort of, a building without a single uh, backside, if, if this is the more kind of public side, this side is actually still fully public facing and, and animated with the daily life of, uh, of the building. And, and inside, sort of looking from the plaza, if you take off the facade, you have sort of public access all along the, um, the western facade. And, and in here you have cafes and, and foyer functions, uh, ticketing, but you also have elevators and, and a sequence of escalators that actually takes you straight up to, uh, to the upper level of the foyer and further around the corner. Um, I am not getting beautiful. Uh, further around the corner, all the way directly up to a major public restaurant that overlooks the inner city, the Prague Castle and the river, and a kind of more fine dining restaurant on the other side overlooking uh, um, the, 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 the eastern part of the, of the river. But essentially also here, 
a, a public cafe and bar and also dedicated bars to, to the different uh, uh, performance halls and, uh, and a kind of central major public stair that connects all the levels of the, of the main performance hall all the way down into, uh, into, the, into the basement. So, so here you see the space inside. You can see how the different balcony levels actually move out and kiss the facade. So each level of the balconies actually have access to, to the outside. And you can see that the escalator here moving up inside the sort of translucent wall uh, of the performance hall, sort of moving all the way up to, uh, to the top of the building. And here, sort of looking along the, the facade of the main plaza, you have this kind of Pyrenean space where every single level expresses itself. And you can see like the moment where there's the possibility to connect to the outside, the kind of balcony level sort of stretches out and kisses the facade and creates a, a, a connection. As, as you turn the, 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 the corner here, uh, moving over to the riverside, you find this kind of moment where you have the sort of um, the ticketed foyer where you are looking over the river as you're waiting for the performance to, to begin. And, and you have the kind of spinal stair that goes uh, up through the whole, uh, uh, whole environment. Uh, and, and here sort of looking at, at the kind of central moment with the two sides of the foyer and this kind of spinal stair connecting all the way up to the top of the building. So then, of course, we, we put a lot of energy into the, to the halls, because essentially the halls is why, why we're here. So the main hall, the orchestra rehearsal, which is essentially the, the kind of workspace for the orchestra where they fine tune uh, uh, the, the performance. Uh, so similar proportions, identical stage to the, to the main hall, uh, the small hall, uh, and, um, and the multipurpose hall. Uh, and, and for each of the halls, we try to sort of take advantage of the sort of presence of, of craft and, 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 uh, and, and materials. So um, since a major part of the Valtava River goes through the, the sort of Bohemian forest, uh, looking at, at the locally sourced uh, timber as the kind of experience, S similarly sort of uh, steam form timber for the, for the orchestra rehearsal, so the two, the two stages, the two halls have a similar uh, or as identical as, as possible acoustics. Uh, the small hall, using locally sourced stone, as you see it in the historical architecture. Uh, and then the multi-purpose hall, we see it as a more sort of industrial kind of a factory for, uh, for musical performances. Um, so for the, for, the, for the main hall, you really want to, it, it is like a perfectly tuned instrument, and you want to bring every single member of the audience as close to the to the sound and uh, and the sight of the uh, of the orchestra, so it's essentially sort of a series of uh, overlapping uh, balconies, almost like a a pine cone inside out, and and there's like a, a public or like a an accessible journey, so every single part of the of the hall is actually sort of interconnected. So you can go for a little promenade uh, inside the hall um, to achieve the the texture. Uh, uh, that you need. Um, when you go to historical halls, uh, the ornamentation, the wood carvings, the decoration is actually part of the acoustic performance because the complex geometry creates a dispersal of sound that creates a kind of crisp uh, um, uh, um, um, s sound uh, 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 image. So in that sense, the, all the wood we imagine it's, cu it's cut from the organic uh, edge of the tree. So the kind of texture you see is almost like nature's own ornament. That means that uh, all of the sound is, is, is perfectly sort of uh, dispersed. Uh, and you can see this kind of overlapping of, uh, uh, of balconies that are all sort of interconnected and how that sort of continues up in the geometry of the, of the roof. And then the sort of the main reflector in, in the ceiling, um, made with a local manufacturer of cast glass, uh, so almost like a, an acoustic uh, chandelier that disperses light and, and sound perfectly into the, into the hall. Um, for, for, the, for the orchestra rehearsal, 
um, that, that is essentially like the workshop for the orchestra, where they fine-tune the, the music. Uh, again, sort of echoing this idea of, of tree trunks, uh, the, the, con, um, the convex shape, again, gives a good sound dispersal, that the sound is, is spread from the, uh, from the curve of the convex uh, forms, steam-formed uh, timber in the ceiling and on, on the walls. Um, for the small hall, um, a, a kind of more formal uh, rectangular hall with a, with a, with a flexible uh, uh, rake. That means that you can sort of vary the, the, the slope and even create a, a, a flat floor. And here we're imagining sort of locally sourced stone, the, the, the same stone that you see in the historical uh, facades. But instead of having it as a polished uh, finish, actually the raw uh, broken stone so that, again, the, the, the sort of organic texture of the, of the stone itself actually becomes like a nature's own ornament that not only looks beautiful and will catch the light in dramatic ways, but also disperses the, the, the sound in, in dramatic ways and, and creates this kind of crisp uh, acoustic. And then finally, the, um, the multi-purpose hall, uh, like almost like a machine for, for musical uh, performances, uh, again with a fully adjustable floor, and, and, and we imagine every single surface uh, is, is like a metal grating. So um, fully flexible, you can mount, you can uh, deploy, you can light, you can sound through every single surface. Uh, nothing is not capable of, of, of being attached to, but it can still actually create uh, a kind of very raw, but also a very spectacular uh, uh, sort of visual and, and, and acoustic uh, uh, in, environment. And, and then sort of as, as, the, as the last uh, elements, <clears throat> the creative hub is essentially uh, a music school with a major uh, uh, um, school hall uh, and a musical library uh, with, with, with study rooms and, uh, and spaces for the uh, for, the, for the music teachers, it's the upper two floors, right above the the top of the uh, of the foyer, uh, and and here the an image of the of the library itself, with the study rooms on one side and like shelves up against the view of, of the city, and you can see how the 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 slope of the of the sort of public promenade above you sort of comes down from the majestic to the intimate uh, in either end. Um, and then, of course, the, the school hall, which becomes almost like similar in, in, in size to the, to the orchestra rehearsal, but as a, as a real public space where the school can make sort of internal concerts and where you can actually really invite uh, parents and family and, 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 and guests to enjoy. And that also becomes part of the, of the spectacle as you, as you walk up and down the, uh, the, the, the building from the outside. And then finally, sort of on top, uh, the kind of destination at the summit, uh, two major restaurants, uh, a massive uh, restaurant overlooking uh, the, the, the river, uh, the bridges, you look down towards Prague Castle, you see the, the, the hills uh, of the city and the entire skyline, and uh, you, can, you can basically jet here with, uh, with the escalators, and once you've, uh, you're full of lunch, you can then sort of use uh, gravity to uh, to lead you down uh, a beautiful promenade down to the to the edge of the river, uh, and then in the in the other end, uh, a more intimate, more discreetly uh, located kind of fine dining restaurant uh, that has striking views uh, towards the the east and uh, and the river's bend as it continues around uh, Prague Seven. So um, so so I think in 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 many ways, <clears throat> a, a lot of the sort of um, a, a lot of the ideas and intentions that we had in the, in the competition have, have more than survived uh, its encounter with reality. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically, as, as, the, as the project stands, uh, stands today, this is, this is what uh, the Baltimore Philharmonic should look like uh, in uh, 2032, uh, when we are all wiser and <laughs> so, um, so it's uh, it, it's been it's been an incredible process. Uh, some uh, some uh, some great decisions we're taking about 
the integration into the urban environment uh, in, in Prague City, uh, in Prague 7 uh, th this morning. And it, and it feels like um, uh, we, we are sort of off to a, a, a great beginning. It's, it's roughly the first third of the process we've been through. And uh, if, if, if each phase adds to the, to the overall experience, as I think the first third has, has done, this, this could be uh, one of the, the most exciting places, uh, not only in Prague, but maybe uh, on the planet. <laughs> this, is, this is all I have. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe also to mention, um, I mean, I, th I think the idea is to take a, a little bit of a conversation uh, uh, if anyone has uh, qu questions or comments. And, and then also maybe I just want to mention that, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, so, so some, some people from my own team, uh, Jan Magazanik, who is a, uh, a, a citizen of, uh, of Prague, actually. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and 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 Daria and uh, and and Shane, uh, who uh, who are toiling uh, the, the the last year and a half of the, of their lives to to make make this happen. Yeah, maybe get up. Uh, and and um, and then also also um, uh, uh, Af Afri, uh, our 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 local collaborators uh, uh, are here also. Who uh, is going to take a, an increasing, uh, uh, in, incre increasing stake in this? Maybe Andri. Uh, uh, I can't see anyone. Maybe they left. Oh, may oh they're here. Here, the, the handsome devils uh, uh, at, at the back of the room. So, so, uh, so I suggest also. Uh, uh, I suggest uh, saving a few questions for them. <laughs> okay, thank you, Berke. Thank you for coming to camp and, and delivering the lecture and spending your time on this project. Uh, I think we all appreciate this. Uh, and please, uh, now it's your turn, and you've got really this chance to, to ask this guy anything, and he's going to try to answer as, as honestly as he can. Uh, so there's a couple of people with microphones. Also, I have one. Uh, so please just wave at me, and, uh, and we'll try to deliver the microphone as fast as we can. So let's, let's try. I see one over there. And remember, please, the best questions are the shortest ones. I see. Uh, thank you, Mr. And pl please just stand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ingalls, for, for the lecture, for, uh, for the project. Uh, my question is, uh, what is honestly the biggest challenge of uh, this project for you? I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, with a, with a little bit of Optimism, I, th I think the, big, the biggest challenge is so far, and that's essentially a, a disproportionate amount of our energy has gone into s solving the, the Gordian knot uh, of the existing site. Uh, you know, how, how do you actually allow a public building to connect down to the, to the waterfront while still having on and off ramps connecting to a highway? Uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 the tr and the train above and the metro below and 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 even the today the the street is not really at grade. There's a tram that goes under the 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 the, the, the road, even though it's a normal urban road, goes up like an elevated highway almost. Uh, and to to um, to resolve all that, not only has been a sort of engineering and traffic and flow and st structural challenge, but also even some kind of legal challenges with some things are grandfathered in, and even though they're terrible now, the second you change them, uh, all the rules change. And I think um, with a little bit of optimism, it feels like those hurdles may be behind us. Uh, and then, of course, um, um, I, I think in the, in the next stage, so it's really been about programming and urban integration. 
uh, in the next stage, a lot of our focus is going to be on sort of optimizing the in environmental performance uh, of the building. I, I mean, of course, we, we already have principles in place of locally sourced natural materials like timber and stone, uh, taking advantage of, of local expertise in, in sourcing some of the uh, special materials like the, 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 the Prague uh, uh, tradition and, and heritage of, 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 of cast and blown glass. And like, so in that sense, um, but we have pretty high ambitions on the sort of environmental certification and performance of the building. So I think that's going to be our, our challenges. And, and of course, to do all that, while uh, keeping the economy in, uh, in place, I think is going to be the headline for the next third. And then I think the last third, uh, we are, we're probably going to have an endless list at that point of, uh, of biggest challenges to, to deal with. But I think right now we have a, a little moment where it feels like we can exhale for five seconds. <laughs> five, five seconds. There was one, I, I believe, yeah, please. Wait, 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 wait for a microphone. So my question was, which part or an element has been the most exciting for you in the process and the whole project? I mean, I, I think. Um, I mean, I think. I think first of all, the overall idea is is this idea of of, of a building that is sort of uh, almost like insanely accessible uh, and inviting for, for anyone, and. Um, and I thought we went quite far in, in, the, in the competition, but then I think we realized that uh, um, our first meeting with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Martin and Martin, it's very easy, the, the clients use the same name, so... <laughs> but uh, they, they almost, we were almost encouraged to step, step up the ambition. I was like, asked to introduce the kind of, the, 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 the cascade of escalators that takes you straight to the, to the roof. And, and then this idea of, of actually encouraging the accessibility of the building on, uh, on all levels. I, I think that's maybe urbanistically and architecturally the most exciting. But then I think personally, the, the work we're going to put into the, the halls. Uh, and I, th I think a lot of things need to be solved. But I'm very excited about you know, this idea of, 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 of cutting the tree trunks so that the, the texture of the tree trunk uh, and the edge of the tree is the ornament of the hall, and splitting the, the rocks with a single uh, surgical uh, uh, you know, hit, so it, it has this kind of perfect imprint of the veins of the rock, and using that as the ornamentation. I, I think to deliver that as an architectural experience would be, uh, uh, would, would be one for, for the CV. I was asked to bring you a bit more to the light. Yes, <laughs> step into the light. Anyone else, please? Yeah, over there. How would you describe uh, the experience uh, working in the Czech environment compared maybe to the other countries where you worked in? And I would like to ask for as honest a question as you can give. It's much better. <laughs> here, here is better. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think we've uh, I think we've had a a, a, good, a good little uh, a good little learning curve, uh, and I think um, yeah, yeah so, so, so like like in any process, we've 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 had some ups and downs, and and I think there's also it's also like finding out the, uh, th there's multiple mayors, there's multiple concerns uh, in in this particular project. So uh, uh, just like the the site is a bit of a Gordian knot in terms of traffic. Uh, it's also a little bit of a Gordian knot in terms of uh, uh, interest groups and jurisdictions, uh, uh, but, but I think um, I, I think we have we have a very strong uh, uh, local uh, cli client group, so uh, we, we're in very capable hands. And th there's nothing like a little bit of adversity to uh, galvanize uh, a group into. Uh, I think we all feel like comrades in arms. I think when. When when uh, when, uh, when when Prague Seven decided to uh, uh, appro approve the the, the, the final proposed uh, traffic solution this morning, I think we all felt that we we we've, we've been through a three ba battle and uh, and with, with a happy ending. So uh, so I, I think um, we have uh, after after SD uh, 
you know, Afri, us, the, the client group, has, has become a, a, a single organism. We may be a single person at the end of the, of the process. <laughs> I'll see you. Thank, thank you for the lecture. And uh, I have a question. What was the hardest obstacle you, have to, you had to overcome in this project? Um, yeah, but, but I, I think with the fear of, um, of, of, of repeating the same answer, uh, w w <laughs> We also, also cause you, you can imagine, like, uh, we, um, at the end of the day, what, what, the, what the audience will experience is, of course, the, the public presence, all the spaces that you can enjoy, and then, of course, the, the, both the visual and, and, of course, the acoustic atmosphere of, of the great halls. So that's where, in a way, we would like to spend most of our energy and our resources and our money uh, so, so to really solve everything that you don't see. Uh, and I would say, un until now, I would say maybe 90% of the battle has been from here and down. Um, and, and the better we do our job doing that, the, the, more, the more money there will be left to do everything from here and, and up. Um, so so I, I, th I think that and, and, and I think all, all of us can't wait to, uh, to, uh, to have endless meetings looking at different samples of uh, hand-cut timber from the Bohemian Forest. Uh, because uh, un until now, we've been doing a lot of uh, turning radii for uh, descending and decelerating uh, cars. So, um, but, um, but, but, but the good thing about having, having that behind us is that uh, I think we're off uh, to, uh, to a great place uh, at, uh, at this point. Uh, hello, um, my, I'll, I'll have two questions actually. So, uh, first one is kind of personal. I live almost like two, three hundred meters from the location. So, seeing this recently and knowing it will be finished in eight years, when I'll be almost fifty, puts me in a really interesting. There's nothing spot. wrong with being almost fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. You look good. <laughs> Um, so what, when looking at this building and knowing that Prague is not really a rooftop city, like we have some rooftops, not many, but this is really a rooftop on a big scale for, for Prague um, or what we are used to in here. Uh, was, it a, was it a challenge or what was, the, what was the discussion around the rooftop and like the security? Because I mean, immediate question to my mind was like a silly one. Oh, because some some people will jump or something. You know, <laughs> like like an immediate worry when I see a rooftop that high in Prague <laughs> feels a bit weird. So that's one. And the other one was uh, more about the e ecology and uh, climate change and so on. When you were discussing it, so uh, if you can maybe elaborate more about some elements that are uh, used in here that should fight against uh, all these problems. Yeah, exactly. Like, <clears throat> may maybe starting with that one. <clears throat> um, I mean, and I, I, think, I think, again, like, P P Prague, um, Prague may, may not be a, a rooftop city, but if you walk around in the city, it is full of, of lookouts and, like, like belvederes. And so in that sense, the, the natural landscape itself is is so incredibly three-dimensional. And in that sense, we just try to bring some of that quality of the, of the landscape into the, into the architecture. Um, and, and I think it will provide um, a, a very lively and interesting building, not just before and after performances in the evening, but, uh, but throughout the, the day and the, and the, and the evening. Um, of, of course, like the, the, the first kind of climate-related issue is, is resilience, that, that it's, it's on the river and, and you've had your fair share of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of floods. So the, the, the whole kind of base of the building 
is 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 dealing with that as intelligently as possible. So like, you you essentially have spaces that can be enjoyed and and accessed in general, but can also endure uh, a, a flash flood. Um, and 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 then I would say, in, as as I mentioned, the next stage where we go from now and and the next third, let's say, is is where we're going to focus a lot on the. On environmental targets, we want to try to uh, to reach um, uh, uh, lead, lead platinum if if, if possible, and, um, and 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 one of the things is like the the, the main materials of the building, essentially the, the the timber and the and and the stone, the the underside and the overside, um, is 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 a locally sourced material uh, that ha that is as carbon neutral as possible because like the transportation. From the from the quarry and the transportation from the from the forest is is, is going to be uh, to be minimal. So in that sense, the more you can harness locally available resources and, and skills, uh, the better. the the large uh, The large glass facades uh, are like um, maximally insulated uh, glass, and the large overhangs, the, the 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 generous canopies provide not only shelter from the rain but also shade. From the sun, so you have a lot of passive shading. We've also, on on some of the facades, optimized the envelope to a proportion of transparent and and, and clear that that gives you the the ideal uh, uh, thermal performance. And, and 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 then the building is, is is quite quite compact. And I think in the in the coming stages, we're going to look. We just finished our own headquarters where we worked with a, a, a the first use of its kind cement in. A, in, a, in an architectural building in, in, in Denmark, a, a product called Future Sim, where a third of the cement has been replaced with clay. So it creates a slightly warmer color of, of the concrete, but it also reduces the carbon footprint with a, with a third. Um, and, and then there, there's like interesting things that, that you can do, like for instance, like when you have a concrete surface, if you don't, if you don't cover it, but leave it exposed, the the concrete in a way will keep curing and it will recarbonize CO2 from the atmosphere. It can be as little as five and as much as 25 percent of the of the total emission in the lifetime of the of the building. So I think there's a there'll, there'll be like a, a whole little checklist because because what we found is that when it comes to sort of optimizing the environmental performance of the building. It's not like one magic bullet. It's more like in every decision, you try to make it as thoughtfully optimized to this particular climate in this particular economy with the access to these particular materials. Uh, and, and that's how you get to, uh, to, uh, to lead platinum. And the rooftop? Sorry? The, the other question about the rooftop and the roofscape? Yeah, but I, I think I started okay. with that. Okay. Right? But, but let's say... Uh, do, you, do you feel? I, I mean, the... The fear of falling down, or no, no, actually, no. But I think that I, th I think the 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 uh, uh, what is the appropriate term? The Pragas? What what are you? Pragonians? <laughs> Prague? Pragisens? Uh, I, th I think people in Prague already know how to navigate quite complex three-dimensional urban environments. <laughs> Okay, uh, I apologize for a little nepotism, but I can't say no to this guy. So that we're gonna take one question in Czech, uh, and I know about you. Jak to, že některé ty projekty jsou postavené a některé ne? Nebo? How come some yes. of, how come some of your projects are not built, and some no, of them they are? No, actually, it's uh, I ask myself the same question, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think. I do ask myself the same question. It's it's a very good question, and I would wish, I would wish that all of them were built. Um, but I I have a feeling that everything I showed today was built or in the process of getting built. So um, when you become as old as I am shortly, they will all be built, e even the even the Philharmonic. But, but but just just to give you an example, uh, how old are you? So you're eight. So um, 
so th this this pr this project uh, it will it is it is going to take as long from now on until it's finished as you have lived on earth <laughs> that's uh <laughs> so uh like um I, I will be almost 60 when it's done. <laughs> okay. We have another one over there. I would like to ask, uh, as you mentioned many times, that we'd like to have as much as possible local sources. But what about textile? Because I guess it will be a lot of seeds. And will be some Czech company or Danish quadrat company? No, I, 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 mean, I, 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 I know that uh, that all, all tech, textile manufacturers would would, uh, would would love to do a project like this, uh, but but again, but again, I I think you know we, we haven't we haven't sourced any any of these these details yet, but but I, but I think as much as possible we want to take advantage of the of, of the local know-how. Do you happen to be a Czech textile manufacturer? <laughs> 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 to be continued. Okay. Hello, my name is Emma. Uh, I apologize, I came later. Uh, so, might be you already talked about uh, accessibility for wheelchair users and handicapped people. Uh, how I can see from outside, it looks quite uh, accessible and obviously very beautiful building. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm used to like wheelchair user almost 20 years on wheelchair. I'm used to that, that uh, in Prague is not uh, necessary matching the result of accessibility uh, by new buildings. So is that like uh, everything, <laughs> everything good for us, for, for using inside and outside? Because I see there are some ways which are, I don't know if it goes in the water or something. <laughs> But uh, um, uh, you, you, I see, you, you for need, example, you need good breaks. No, no. For no, no. for example, yeah, I mean, we can swim directly. I can understand that. <laughs> um, exactly, and, it's incredibly uh, convenient. No, no, but like. Uh, but the roofs, for example, they are not covered. So uh, someone already mentioned it that probably by a rain or snow it could be a little bit tricky, and uh, especially I'm interested in this. Uh, Top roof. Uh, is there some lift from inside, or how I mean, is it I actually with the space inside and uh, amenities like uh, your chair, user toilets, and everything? Thank you. Yes, I mean, again, uh, there is of course like a lot of details that haven't been uh, ironed out yet, but uh, but but the kind of blanket uh, ambition and requirement is, is to have a fully accessible. Uh, building uh, accessible for all, and and I think to to start with the um, the fact that the building itself connects to all the different levels of the outdoor uh, uh, terraces gives you uh, direct horizontal accessibility to to major locations. Of course, like in certain places, you have dramatic stairs, but then you will have access to to some of the main landings on the way. So there is there, there is access. Throughout the whole building, of course, also on the, on the inside, and then of course also a, a lot because of the, the the canopies are really qu quite generous. So major parts of the of the kind of promenade on the outside of the building is also uh, uh, on the roof. No, no, not 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 the entire roof, but but there was there's always a substantial part of it that is uh, that is under cover. So um, I think you will enjoy it. Yes. No, I tell you, we're, we're not going to change, uh, change our ways uh, here. <laughs> okay. There was another question, do I believe, or no? OK, I'll see you. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, is on Vltava Philharmony something some details, some ID, something. Uh, uh, what do you? Uh, sorry. Uh, what do you like more than s some details in in another projects uh, which uh, which you made? 
Um, is there something? <sighs> I mean, I mean, I, I think I think the the departure. I mean, I, I normally like to say that at its best, architecture is a is is like the art of portraiture. Um, in the sense that um, you know, is 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 the Mona Lisa uh, an expression of of Da Vinci as a as a as a as an artist, or is it uh, an expression of Mona Lisa, the woman that it portrays? And of course, the answer is both. And I think a, a, a great portrait can capture not only the likeness. Uh, but also the character, the soul, the potential of, a, of the subject. And, and in architecture, I think what, what we try to do in a way is to create a portrait, an architectural portrait of how we see Prague. And I think, I think that is this, and, 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 and this, this is a pretty exciting uh, portrait to, to get to realize. So, in, th in that sense, I think it already has, has that kind of inherent Prague-ness from the river to the roof, uh, the kind of 21st century equivalent of the Prague castle, uh, in my own humble uh, <laughs> ambition. Uh, but, um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you can dream, you know. Uh, but, but also just remember that it's also that in the architectural design process, like I think it, a lot of people like to to worship the idea of the 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 genius sketch on a napkin, and this idea that the whole project is conceived in a single eureka moment. And I think what makes it exciting, and and you know, I think we have a total of three years of of doing the the full work until we can go into a, a tender, um, is that a lot of the ideas that will be striking. Uh, when you go see the building in 2032, uh, have have not been uh, formulated yet. So once we have to deal with like the the the, the textiles, some of the kind of uh, material finishes, the the, the seats, a, a lot of the, a lot of the ideas that haven't even been framed yet. Uh, th that's what makes it very exciting to. To, to be doing this, and that's the, the big change to the to the young gentleman's question before about why we haven't finished all the buildings, you know, is is that uh, uh, what makes it so exciting to not just create the vision, but actually go through with it, is that so many ideas and experiences and contradictions and surprises actually occur when the purity of the initial vision starts encountering the nitty-gritty reality of real life. So, so in that sense, uh, I, I think some of the most striking experiences uh, have yet to be invented in, in the next couple of months and years. But, Bjarke, this is not your first project for Prague. Uh, many years ago, like 18 years ago, you did a competition for library. Uh, do you think that you now know more about Prague than you did in that time? And could you compare like, like your attitude? No, I, I, think, I think I know more about Prague, and I probably also know more about architecture 18 years <laughs> later. Uh, so um, so uh, it, 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 was, it was pretty bold, but also uh, a, a bit sort of uh, uneven uh, uh, proposal we ended up doing. There was a lot of energy in it, uh, but it's maybe a good thing we, uh, we didn't win that one. Um, so so I, th I think in that sense, uh, of, of course, when, when you're younger, uh, especially in architecture, because there is this catch-22 that no one will trust you to, do, to design a building until you've already designed such a building. And, 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 and once you get to design your first building, then they will only let you design the same kind of building. So, so you know, into your late 40s, you still have to struggle uh, to, to get to design a, a philharmonic. Uh, and in 2032, I can now say I'm now an architect of philharmonics. So now you can trust me with more philharmonics. Uh, but but um, but but then, of course, as as you as you grow older, 
as, so in that sense, when, when you're young, you're constantly fighting against that uh, dogma. Uh, and rightfully, you can say that actually the freshness of perspective maybe is why we should be, because we don't suffer from uh, skilled incompetence. We don't know the answers already, so we, we will actually th think hard about the problems and maybe arrive at new solutions. That's why you should hire us. Uh, and then, of course, as you grow older uh, and, and now have experience, uh, you can see the advantages of, uh, of some experience. And I think, um, in, in some way, what, what you should try to do is, because uh, the great thing about having, um, I've been practicing for two decades uh, now, uh, I started my, my first architecture company in, in, the, in the year 2000. Um, is that um, you, you've tried and failed enough times, and you know, the, the only really good thing that is to say about failure is that you do actually learn from it if it doesn't kill you, right? So, so uh, and, and I think if you can retain the kind of energy to. Uh, desire to try things differently and combine it with a kind of ability to, to discriminate between which are the important battles. Maybe because in, in the end we are living in a, we're practicing in a, in a field with finite resources. There's, there's not unlimited time schedule, there's not unlimited, uh, although until 2032 seems quite unlimited, but, but uh, there's, there's not unlimited budget, there's, there's not unlimited uh, favors you can ask in a, in a collaboration. So you have to somehow use those resources wisely. And, and therefore, I think what you get better at with experience is to, in a way, discriminate between which battles are really fundamental and which ones actually don't matter at all. Because also one of the things you notice sometimes is that you maybe fought like a beast for months. And then in the end, you sort of had to say, okay, fuck it. And then like that second, you realized ah, it doesn't matter. This is not what this project is all about. It's about something completely different. So wh why did we spend all this energy on something that isn't really what the project is about? And I, and I think that, that ability to discriminate, you gain it with experience. And, and in that sense, I think we're much better equipped to deliver um, uh, now than, than if we would have won 18 years ago. Uh, also, also, they never built the, the library, so I'm glad we didn't win that one. <laughs> um, Last couple of questions. Yes. Thank you. In your creative process, uh, do you listen to music? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I think. It's it, like n not so much in the in the kind of conscious creative process where you are actively trying to solve a problem or generate an idea, but then I think there's a major part of architecture that is a more tactile, uh, physical activity where you are you're drawing things you are you are you know you're making models you are you are in a way thinking with your hands and it's a less con conscious con cognitive process and there we listen to a lot of music uh, because it you, you get into a kind of flow state uh, and and the, and the music doesn't compete but actually kind of blends with that more subconscious part of the practice. Because I think there's a major part of architecture has an aspect of performing arts where there is part of the craft is doing things and doing it right. Uh, and you know, like, and, and, and there uh, it can be accompanied by music uh, and, and making it, so, which, which, which means that a deadline can, can turn into the feeling of a party. Also, sleep deprivation is almost as good a drug as, as drugs. So, so you definitely have moments 
where it feels like a, a psychedelic party when it's actually just a, an exhausting deadline, <laughs> including the music. Hi. Uh, could I have a question about the site itself? Do you feel like it's a good fit for this uh, magnificent design, or would you rather uh, would you rather choose a different site yourself? In no, no, but I think uh, I mean, I mean, it's a true question in the sense that uh, uh, I was quite excited that we had a ticket uh, to uh, to participate in the competition for the Philharmonic in Prague, um, and. Um, uh, so, so went to Prague for a long weekend to visit the site, but also re reacquaint myself with the city and um, m meet with different people. Um, Jan uh, knows uh, every person in Prague, I feel. So uh, to try to sort of uh, listen and learn and understand what this project was all about, try to understand what were the conversations that had been had in the past, what were the critical issues, but of course, to also walk the site and feel the site. And, um, and, and considering how beautiful a city Prague is, the site as it stands is, is not that. Um, but I think the great thing is that the site is as Prague as it can be in the sense that it's right on the river. It has, it has two bridges. It has visibility uh, uh, on, on the long, kind of long axis of the river all the way down to to Prague Castle, but it's also far enough from the kind of ultra-historical uh, uh, city to, to, to not have to tread as carefully. If we were right on the Charles Bridge, we, 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 we might be so restricted out of respect. Uh, whereas I think here, and also it's great that if, if, if there was some kind of very precious situation, it could be very hard to justify a lot of things. Whereas here, once, once the building is built, you, you, you won't know of all the complexity uh, of what happens around and underneath. And, and all you will see is, I think, a, a very sort of contemporary reinterpretation of, of the aspects of Prague. So, uh, so I think in that sense, you, you could not wish for a better site. And, and I think it will also slightly shift the center of gravity of Prague's self-understanding uh, further to the, to the east. I'm afraid it was the last question. Uh, and uh, we're going to move uh, to the little exhibition over there. Bjarke is going to stay for a moment uh, also in there. So if you can approach him and ask him personally, I think like he's welcome to answer your questions over there. Uh, so Bjarke, again, thank you very much for your time, for your lecture, and for answering. Thank you.